So this is the gay agenda. You're going to convert us through perfume. Yeah. Um, and I mean that actually. Uh, no, and it, it's it's happening. It is yeah. happening. Um, and I mean it, and I want it yeah, because mm -hmm. gay culture, gay men, gay male culture for me, and I've written about it, is like one of the two or three or four most liberating or liberatory forces in American popular culture for the last century or so or more. Mm -hmm. um, heroes to me, like the that pre marriage, the pre marriage gays. You know, yeah. I mean, they brought how much of American fun and style and fashion and pleasure. I mean, you know, you got African Americans and Jews and then there's gays. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. if you take those groups out, this is this is definitely the neoliberal hellscape you're talking about without those groups, right? And now those groups are becoming assimilated. Sure. More and more. yeah. And people uh, fundamentally misunderstand that too. I mean, no one since history itself and like having an inter interest in history is stigmatized now um, <laughs> by the libs because, you know, that's just history is just a tool of white supremacy and patriarchy. Yeah. Well, the wrong reading, reading is a tool of white supremacy and patriarchy. Yeah. Um, but people misunderstand. Um, I'm always saying this on my show, but regular gay men are not contained in the current LGBTQ plus acronym. Like it's not just a mild hostility towards them. It's literally two separate things. They're, yeah. they're quite open about what they think of regular gay men. Yeah. Um, we're about, I mean, we don't have barely any kind of privileged victim status anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, unless you totally like make yourself spiritually female or physically female, you know, like you have to kind of uh, <laughs> bow to the altar of, uh, yeah. of femaleness in order to be this little court jester for the, uh, the LB, oh, wow. UT, all the other ones, which is mainly just kind of this, this uh, voting block of the Dem and propaganda wing of the Democrat party. But a uh, regular gay men, I mean, I think regular gay men and uh, straight men are really uh, getting together and uh, preserving the West or preserving, uh, you know, <laughs> everything interesting about culture right now because we're both so alienated. And as Paulia said, um, gay men used to be the ones who would say things that absolutely no one else would say. Um, <laughs> yep. And I'm using what little bit of gay victim privilege or whatever that gets me to say things that no one else will say. Yeah, you're the last, you're the last one. You're the last dangerous fag, right? <laughs> yes, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we'd like for there to be more. I mean, but no, yeah. No, I would like for there to be more, but I mean, all people do, like the kind of go-to, um, uh, I don't want to say the word cancel, but like if you're a uh, gay that like doesn't do what you're supposed to, they just like accuse you of being another Milo. Right. So that like Milo right. provided the template for, oh, right. uh, for the libs to just be like, Oh, it's another Milo. Like he's the example that was right. like, you know, put in the stocks on the, right. on the square. Right. Well, the Nazis you don't want to were... be another Milo, do you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Nazis were gay too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen their posters? It's true. Mm. There was homoerotica running all through the Nazi propaganda. Well, look, this book right here, Male Fantasies. Is that? That's about, all about that. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Mm. By the way, there's quite a bit of very similar um, homoerotica in the New Deal propaganda too, in the 1930s here. So if you look at the, mm -hmm. you look at like road building projects, pick posters for them in, in Germany and road building projects, posters for them in America. They're the same thing. They're two young slender men shirtless hugging each other or like having an arm over, over each other's shoulders, smiling out in, out in nature, you know? Um, so well, unfortunately gay rights destroyed homoeroticism forever. I mean, I think gay marriage kind of destroyed homoeroticism because really yeah. uh, like men were just much closer with each other and, you know, much more open at, every other and i'm not talking just sexually like emotionally everything mm -hmm. less closed off with each other um at every point in history before the 2010s <laughs> like yep. and you could still get a, a touch of this uh a little sense of this with those like good old boys that'll you know like play grab ass with you and like they're very flirty like old like southern men yeah. and, and not in a, not in a, like I'm not saying they're homosexual, but it's a, a kind of flirtation, yes. <laughs> you know, just the kind of like uh, courtship that's there that used to be there in like 
regular male friendships that now yeah. everybody's just so like just totally asexual and like well i'm not gay so why would i be flirty with any you know nobody's any fun anymore i agree so that was all you know that was all explicit and planned that was the yeah. purpose that was the purpose of gay marriage it was stated at the beginning explicitly mm -hmm. by the leaders of the movement andrew sullivan and larry kramer gave speeches and wrote articles at the beginning of the gay marriage movement saying just that we need to close the bathhouses and stop fucking in the bushes those are quotes mm -hmm. from those guys and they were like the lead and that's exactly what it became so it went from like naked people and drag queens at pride to wells fargo and bank of america at pride and in fact they've now barred drag queens from most i think are many pride parades something like that at least there's been a lot of talk about yeah that. drag queens are barely allowed to exist anymore i mean it has right. to uh, it has to be like repurposed and done in the language of the the trans stuff uh, right but so you know like rupaul's drag race is a great show it's one of the most influential shows of the 2010s but there's a, a point in the middle of it where it turns into something else entirely hmm. basically kind of before trump there were a lot of people in the culture that were sort of like anti-pc mm -hmm. uh like rupaul like joyce carol Oates, <clears throat> it used to be like a troll online yep, i know um and like libs hated her yeah. Uh, all of these people ran right back into the closet as soon as Trump came out and suddenly they would not say anything, but like the first several seasons of drag race are amazing. Like, uh, yeah. RuPaul ha had them doing like gone with the wind challenges. <laughs> uh, they awarded Sharon needles, the win in the best season. And uh, Sharon like wore like Confederate flag bathing suits on the show. Uh, had a history of signing like headshots with the N word, hard R, um, <laughs> wore swastikas with his boyfriend, Alaska, who's also one of the great ones, oh, wow. like drew swastikas on their faces. This was back when like hipsters were fun and everything. But just as, a, <laughs> as an example of, wow. uh, you know, I'm surprised that season hasn't been totally memory hold. Yeah. So, wow. I didn't, I didn't know it was that radical. I watched those mm -hmm. seasons and it was, I remember just thinking, and I know the guys who made that show, um, World of Wonder, Fenton Bailey, Randy Barbato, mm -hmm. and, uh, and went to their parties and stuff. But um, I thought the first three seasons were just staggeringly brilliant. Like I thought it was the smartest show ever on TV. And then yes, it also devolved, I think, into, I went to a live drag race show a couple of years ago in Portland, and it was mostly just talking shit. It was just so much of that, like yeah. really nasty put down humor, which they're really good at. But it's that that old school Don Rickles channeled through like a uh, black drag queen's voice. Uh, they would talk. They would make fun of the audience. They'd make fun of not make fun of. They just eviscerate each other on stage. And I, I that's like the one part of drag that I don't like that culture of put down. Mm -hmm. What do you think? The, about well, that? another aspect of drag race was that it was in the early seasons, it was explicitly a parody of uh, America's Next Top Model and Project Runway. That's and right. this is forgotten because it's now its own phenomenon, but That's like right. the whole Vaseline lens of the first season and the way that RuPaul is just depicted as this all-knowing uh, god, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> all-knowing, uh, what's the word, uh, all-seeing um, kind of entity, uh -huh. like Tyra is yeah. exactly like, like that on America's Next Top Model. Right. And so like the current drag race people and the current like drag queens, which are basically just kind of people who put on makeup and take pictures of themselves for Instagram. There's not mm -hmm. really, like they do these appearances where they kind of bop around to a lip sync, but it's really all just Instagram. Right. Um, and there's very little more to it anymore, but there's no, uh, like cultural backlog in any of these people's minds. They don't even seem aware of the early seasons of the show. Right. They think it's funnier to like just uh, be aggressively like stupid and ageist about it and act like it's bad to, you know, this is something common to liberals where they act like it's actively undignified to like know about <laughs> stuff before the last two years. <laughs> um, right. But the meanness, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not mean. Um, I'm I'm a big softy, uh, <laughs> but I'm a cancer. I cry at everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, the uh, that kind of put down stuff. It worked 
you know, back in the day, like Paris's burning era, when there was actually, you know, a kind of mainstream culture, you know, that was a counterweight to that. But now, just like mean, stupid drag queens are the mainstream culture. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't really say anything. Yeah. <laughs>